Hello everyone. Hey, it's it's good to be here. It's so interesting, isn't it, that compared to the last presentation, um, we are up 67%. Uh, back then in August, the price was $26,000. Right now we're at $43,000. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of ground to cover. It's not going to be only Bitcoin. I want to talk global macro as well. I have a whole bunch of charts to show you. Um, and the, the, the title for this piece, it's all priced in or is it, uh, came from just earlier this week, actually, there was this Belgian newspaper, like the Financial Times of Belgium, if you will, and they came out with an article that claimed, based on anonymous experts of the sector, that uh, Bitcoin's halving and the ETFs are now excessively priced in. So I thought that was quite amusing. Um, also that they didn't even mention who those you know supposed experts were. So yeah, let's just explore that thesis. Like, is it really priced in the, uh, all these events that are um, going to happen over the next few months, or even um, in the coming week? Uh, when if you're talking about the ETFs. So yeah, without further ado, let's um, let's dive in. And I'm going to do global macro first, and then uh, we'll switch over to Bitcoin. So one claim that you see everywhere is that are we going to have a soft landing? Is the soft landing here? Are we going to have a recession? And that's, of course, talking about mainly U.S. stock markets. But as everyone knows, that always reverberates throughout the world. Um, so let's, you know, give this claim a little bit of benefit of the doubt and say, like, all right, well, based on what could we argue that 2024 is going to produce a soft landing for the economy? Um, there is the elections. Uh, almost always when there's an election year, uh, the stock markets get pumped up, um, and it's because, of course, because the, the the White House tends to have political influence on um, the central bank, and so they are able to kind of push towards a softer, um, softer policy. So we'll, we'll talk about that too. Um, you know, just looking at the stock markets, like here's the the world stock market index. It looks fine. Like it doesn't look like any, anything's wrong with it. Not really excessively priced. That, that, I mean, of course, the, it's a parabolic uptrend, which is worrisome because of what's happening with the money. But a lot of analysts think like, oh, yeah, you know, why couldn't we have another great year? Uh, Same like this is the German stock market index looks quite healthy from a, a superficial point of view. And uh, commodities have been kind of softening. Like we had that massive rally in commodities, which fueled so much of the inflation, uh, 2020, 2021, even it kept going in 2022 um, and then uh, it's been going sideways and so that you know that's why I put it here in big letters disinflation is what policymakers uh, want to tell you is happening it's like well technically the inflation is not really reversing we're not seeing deflation but you know uh, there is disinflation happening but so there's an, also another side to that um, coin or that argument like yeah we are going to have a soft landing like could this be wishful thinking i think it really might be uh, i looked up the google trend results for literally soft landing this is going back to 2004 and uh right now we're peaking like this this word is being thrown around everywhere in the media and uh and it's searched for of course because it's what people want but we saw this peak back here which interestingly enough was actually uh, May 2008. So it was before the big crash in 2008 that search results, um, searches for soft landing actually peaked. So it's really no guarantee. It could just be wishful thinking. So let's look at a bit more data and, and, and kind of like, you know, like pull it apart because the markets right now are not homogenous, homogenous at all. Uh, everything is not going to go up or down in lockstep. Like we're seeing more and more decoupling of asset classes. And I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind. Yeah. So let's look at kind of the, the, the foundations of what's going on, especially in the U.S., um, but in other many Western nations as well. Here's a quote from uh, Jeffrey Gundlag. Um, he's a, uh, a known uh, hedge fund manager uh, just a few days ago. So he said, since 2015, the U.S. economy has been running a rising deficit with close to full employment. This is unprecedented. So we have a debt-based economic scheme. The deficit as percentage of GDP is running above 6%. People say this is a good economy, 
but if we actually ran a balanced budget, GDP would be negative over the last 12 months. We cannot go on with this deficit-based scheme. So basically what he's saying is that we're living on borrowed time. The only reason why unemployment isn't much, much higher than it is now is just because the government is, is pumping subsidies in, in the economy that it cannot afford. It's just, uh, it's just uh, going into deficit and uh, money has to be printed to fill that deficit. And, uh, and of course, we all know interest rates are the highest they've been in decades. So the costs, we'll, we'll talk about that later in this uh, presentation, but the cost to even just pay the interest is, uh, is skyrocketing. So this is completely unsustainable. Um, and so there's a, you know, there's, there is a disconnect between what the public feels and believes and what the so-called data is telling us. And then data is, of course, Keynesian-based. It's very uh, kind of superficial and biased, in my opinion, and, and the kind of indicators it looks at. And historically, did quite a good job at, um, at you know, kind of following the public opinion. Uh, but now, since 2020, there's a massive um, uh, chasm between those two. So you can see that here in the graph. Um, people's confidence in the economy is close to the lowest ever. And, uh, but the indicators, and that's why the pundits and the radio and the White House, everybody's saying everything should be fine. We have full employment. What's the problem? Uh, but one of the problems is, of course, the interest rates. And people have racked up a lot of debt in those low inflation, uh, low inflation, low interest rate years. But now we're seeing, and this graph is showing, what people have to spend uh, as a percentage of their disposable income uh, just to kind of pay the interest on their debt. And so we're seeing a similar shift as what happened in the 1980s. Like that was the driver of a lot of the problems in the 80s is that interest rates went sky high and so people's payments uh, obligations went up. And so that means that the real economy is hurting. Uh, also keep in mind, bond markets are still in a massive, massive bear market. Uh, I showed, I think this graph three months ago as well. I just want to remind everyone this is global bonds um, corrected for official inflation, so for CPI inflation. Um, you know, and, and if you actually were to look at the real numbers, uh, real inflation, it would be even lower. But yeah, to put this in perspective, this bond market crash, this is the largest crash since the foundation of the United States. Like this is, you know, completely unprecedented uh, in over 300 years. So, so you know, that, that, you know, the government debt obligations are crashing. That means, at least in my opinion, that has to mean that bailouts are coming because central bankers are very keen to repeat over and over. There is no way for the U.S. government to go bankrupt. We can, there's always more money. We can always print more. And so that to me is a, a, a really important part of what's coming. And it's not just the U.S. Like here is a very long-term chart that shows the U.K. going back 300 years and Canada and Australia, and they all are having these epic historic bond crashes right now. And to kind of give an idea about where that might lead, like why this is so bad, like if a government bond market really crashes even more, you're looking at, I, I bet a lot of you already guessed, like just before the year 1800 in France, that's the French Revolution, right? So that was the hyperinflation just before the French Revolution. And that rent um, chasm down there uh, in the 1920s, that is Weimar Germany. So, you know, and of course, these are crashes where the bond market goes down 75% instead of 25. But um, yeah, it's it's really uh, these are very precarious times. So I, I feel I feel that's important to to emphasize because business as usual, it, it's not. It's no longer business as usual in the investing world. There's giant shifts happening. So briefly, let's also discuss real estate because. Real estate really has been um, a piggy bank for generations of people now, um, especially the boomer generation, uh, as like a, a store of value. And it's understandable because the value, the money keeps going down and you can get cheap mortgages. And so it is just one way to build some wealth and protect yourself from inflation. But um, I've been saying over and over that this, this is, story is coming to an end. Like in dollar terms, real estate might still go up. But when you actually express it in hard assets, which we're going to look at, commodities, then um, real estate actually looks very weak. So, for example, here is um, 
an index from Fidelity, the, the mortgage-backed securities. And in the background there, you see the dollar-denominated uh, chart, which you know doesn't look too terrible. It doesn't look healthy, but it doesn't look too terrible. Um, but then when you look at the commodity-denominated chart in the foreground, well, that's just going... That's just been going sideways since, since 2009. Like you haven't, you haven't made any money. It's just been flat since 2009, and it looking, it's looking like it's going to break down again. Um, so that's just mortgage-backed securities. These are um, the houses themselves, the real estate index, and you know we had so much new construction since uh, the year 2007, 2008. Uh, the quality of the construction has gone down, and yet. If you look at, you know, the commodity expressed value of real estate, it has gone up almost by a factor of uh, ten. I think it's like a factor of seven thereabouts. Um, and so, that is just completely unsustainable. That you know, why do you have to pay uh, seven times more corn or seven times more oil for the same uh, house that's made out of kind of cardboard and sticks, oftentimes, and 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 stone? You could say, but these are you know, real estate at the at the core is a consumer product. It, it decays. It, it it needs constant reinvestment to be upkept. It's not a natural uh, saver. It, it doesn't naturally preserve value. Um, the only reason why there's been a multi-decade-long bull, bull market in it is because the money has been broken and people look at it as a as a backup. So we could see very significant retraces in real estate over the next few years. And so the recent tick up, which mainly is because of weakness in commodities, is um, is um, doesn't change anything uh, about that. Um, there's also knock-on effects, of course. So so these uh, mortgage-backed securities are sitting on the balance sheet of banks, and what you can see here is that especially smaller banks have massive amounts of these mortgage-backed uh, debt obligations, and so they're they're in pro and they're in trouble and they will need bailouts. Uh, there is no doubt about that. And so in my opinion, uh, I think we talked about it last time about the the bank runs that were happening and the bailouts that happened recently in the US, like some of the biggest bailouts, uh, not just since 2008, but basically the bailouts are of the same size as what happened in 2008. So we have this ongoing uh, simmering forest fire that is just not stopping. Like the, the crisis in banking is ongoing. Um, China, I just want to touch briefly because people often think like, oh, maybe the grass is greener elsewhere. Like, let's not over-dramatize things. Um, but there is a lot of instability in the in the East, in Asia, and um, and China's economy is really not, not healthy, in my opinion. Uh, so just to give it a, a quick idea, there's, of course, a lot more data you could pull to substantiate that and look at look at the, the debt ratios and such. But, um, but yeah, here's Chinese stocks. Uh, denominated in U.S. stocks. So clearly, U.S. stocks are just pummeling uh, China stocks. Uh, it's it's not even funny. And here is Chinese stocks expressed in commodities. Uh, kind of like a sideways story. But I mean, keep in mind, these are logarithmic charts. So uh, when things go down, it, it gets really, really ugly. And, and technically, it's already breaking down from that upwards uh, channel. And that's going to be a theme for this uh, presentation as well, like that. That channel that is uh, that was bullish for a long time now is absolutely breaking down against commodities. So again, like I said earlier, you know I don't think this is business as usual anymore, uh, and so we are going to see heroes fall out of their pedestals, um, and I, I believe it's already starting. For example, Carl Icahn, the stock market uh, legend who was always very very outspoken, very, very bold in his moves. Uh, but I believe that he was also quite reliant on that low debt, uh, low interest rate environment. And so ever since uh, uh, last year, 2023, he's, he's gotten really in trouble and his stock is down significantly, even in dollar terms. Here is um, his, uh, his company expressed in commodity terms. Like that's a downfall, all right? To me, that's, that's just a downfall. Even companies like Netflix that people, you know, think are, are, you know, healthy or, you know, are maybe a good bet for the coming decade. Of course, it's it's been an absolutely mind-boggling ascent to the past uh, 10, 15 years. Um, but they as well, they've fallen out of that channel. 
and uh, are likely going to break down more against commodities. Uh, here's Apple. Like again, it's just every time it's that parabolic uptrend that gets broken. Yeah, Warren Buffett is still is still okay for now. Like that that channel has not been broken, but uh, you know, names like that I expect to not do well. Of course, he he's more invested in in basic services than uh, some of these other um, stocks that I showed. So he's a bit more insulated, of course. Um, but even so, you know, like we're talking about a massive undervaluation of commodities, like very simple things like farming and, and energy production, uh, those kind of things, as opposed to uh, consumer-based America. And so here's another, you know, gives an idea of what I'm talking about. This is the NASDAQ expressed in commodities, like just a, a very clear breakdown of a, a, an unsustainable trend. This is literally reality is hitting, right? I mean, commodities are tangible assets that are scarce, and that's kind of running into this uh, this wall of of the wealth without end, like this this illusionary wealth. I've been rewatching the the HBO uh, comedy series Silicon Valley, and and at the time, like we thought it was funny. Like this is uh, what is it now? It was before the pandemic that it came out, maybe twenty eighteen ish. Um, we thought it was funny, but like if you look at it now, it's like really looks like a documentary and really like documented some of these excesses of uh, of Silicon Valley and and the world at large. So this is something that I wanted to show you to to again illustrate how the there has been massive underinvestments in the commodity sector, and that money was shifted away. Those resources were shifted away towards consumer. Um, companies because of all these interventions in, in the financial world. So for example, here you see the CapEx um, that was done in, in the white, in the technology sector versus CapEx in the energy sector. So that that has to switch. That That is just completely unsustainable. So inflation, it's important to mention, especially because, you know, the, the, the refrain in the media and on the radio is that, oh, we're it's everything is disinflationary now. We're fine. Um, no, we're not. <laughs> we're not fine. Uh, so again, I, I use this to also remind myself: inflation is very much a nonlinear phenomenon. Uh, this quote from Germany, or about Germany in 1920, like literally just uh, two years before hyperinflation, the exchange rate of the mark against the dollar and other currencies actually rose for a time. And the mark was momentarily the strongest currency in the world. So let's let's not fool ourselves. You know that these temporary rallies in the dollar and 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 um, other fiat currencies are uh, are sustainable. Uh, here's another parallel with the 1970s. What you see is is um, in blue. You see the inflation of the 1970s, and then mapped against that is what we've seen recently. Um, with the dollar, so so we're we're in that lull phase now, and we're gonna have another. It's just a matter of when we're gonna have another big run up in inflation. So this is probably the most important slide of this uh, presentation, at least as far as global macro is concerned. Um, so right now, this is also from Jeffrey Gunlag's presentation. Um, so right now we are at six uh, percent um, interest, and what you're seeing. Here, interest rates, what you're seeing here are projections based on how the interest rate could change in terms of what percentage the government needs to pay just to keep up with its interest payments. The, and I'm talking about percentage of tax revenue. 100% is halfway this chart, pretty much. So if interest rates go to 9%, then the government will have to default by 2030 because literally 100% of its tax revenues are going to be absorbed by just paying interest. That's the definition of bankruptcy. Um, if the interest rates uh, stay at where they are now at around 6%, then by 2029, 60% of uh, tax revenues are going to go to interest payments. So right now we're at around, I believe it's like 20%. Which is on par? No, it's it's lower, but it's it's on par with the military budget of the U.S. Like that's how much money is being paid just to keep up with interest payments. 
So that's why people who think that we're going to go into a recession, a deflationary recession like 2008, in my opinion, that is madness. That is impossible. Uh, yes, we can have a, a brief crash, but a, protect, uh, a protracted uh, bear market, which means a bull market for the dollar, that I believe is impossible at this point. Um, of course, the Fed, you know, we talked about the elections. So not surprisingly, is all of a sudden turning dovish. So uh, December 2013, they came out with a, a press conference and um, the Chairman Powell said, we believe that we are likely at or near the peak rate for this cycle. So basically, they're not going to raise interest rates anymore. They're, you know, and, and usually interest rates aren't kept flat for a very long time. That probably means he's thinking about lowering them. Um, and if we look globally, uh, interest rate cuts that uh, have already happened at in, uh, central banks, globally speaking, they have been cutting interest rates. Uh, it actually started in 2023 already, and it's just accelerating now. So easing is already happening. Reflation is already on the way. And Bitcoin responds to that. Bitcoin responds to money printing. Uh, that's We'll see it in another slide. Bitcoin responds to money printing, if anything. It doesn't really, it's kind of smart. It's really smart. It doesn't really look at the official inflation rate or prices in the supermarket. It knows that the origin of inflation is the money printing. And so smart money looks at that and just buys more Bitcoin when that's the case. I threw this in here again, just as a reminder, the 1970s was stagflation, just like now. It's probably going to be worse now, but... The asset classes that did very well were scarce assets that had low third-party risk, such as gold and commodities, and value companies did better than growth companies. And um, the worst was, of course, uh, government bonds and such. So let's uh, talk about Bitcoin. So one refrain, like I said in that newspaper article that we keep hearing, is that the Bitcoin ETF and the halving are priced in. And then I wonder, like, how is that possible if nobody even searches for Bitcoin or how to buy Bitcoin. Like the global Google searches for buy Bitcoin are the lowest since December 2019. So pre-Michael Saylor, pre-Michael Strategy, pre all of that. Um, so to me, this is just, in the eyes of the world, we're still in a bear market, even though, yes, you know, we actually are up 67%, but the world is not paying attention yet. Bitcoin OGs, I mean, like uh, people that have old Bitcoin and that control a lot of the old Bitcoin that hasn't moved in a long time are still completely unfazed. So what you see here is the the hodler position change. So the green means that uh, hodlers are just sitting tight, they're not budging, and the red means that they are actually moving their coins, which usually means selling. And so yeah, uh, OGs usually sell into strength, they sell kind of at the right time. And right now, there's just no sign whatsoever of selling. So that's very encouraging. Also, net unrealized profit loss. This is uh, from Glassnode as well. Um, basically, you take all the Bitcoin in the aggregate and you calculate for every Bitcoin, like is it, is it uh, looking at unrealized profits or looking at unrealized losses? And so based on that, you can, in the aggregate, gauge market sentiment. And usually Bitcoin tends to start selling off when more than 70, 75% of, of the entire market is looking at unrealized profits because that's often when greed kicks in. Right now we're at barely 50%. So that sentiment has switched from kind of optimism, anxiety to, to more like belief. Like there's more, there's more confidence in the market now. But definitely I, I believe we're not at, at uh, exuberance or euphoria. Um, the halving is something that is coming. Uh, we're very close now, only 90 days away from uh, Bitcoin supply being cut in half. Um, sorry, I guess I showed this chart because every time you can see this uh, this run up um, ahead of the halving and then into you know after the halving as well. So I think that's that's coming uh, again. Uh, just to like summarize it for you, the daily supply is going to drop from 900 Bitcoin to 450 Bitcoin. That means 20 million a day less of supply in Bitcoin. 
7.3 billion a year at current prices, less available supply in the market. So that really is significant tightening. Um, the annual inflation of Bitcoin um, is going to drop below that of gold. So it's going to drop from 1.6% to 0.8% per year. So I think, you know, that's uh, significant. It's kind of like, it means Bitcoin is harder money than gold, um, even though it always was, but at least now it, it, it's becoming reality. So yeah, is it going to get approved? Are we going to see uh, an, an um, SEC approval of the Bitcoin ETFs? It really does look like it this time. Like I was jaded for a long time. One of the first and major things that convinced me that this time is different is just seeing the advertising dollars that firms are spending to promote, to pre-promote their Bitcoin ETFs because they're all going to be competing if they are approved. I feel like they would only really spend those big dollars if 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 they 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 are actually confident that they will get approved this time. Um, and some of these some of these funds have been applying uh, for five, six, seven, eight years, and only now the big commercials are coming out. Also, the betting markets uh, are giving it eighty one percent chance that uh, the Bitcoin ETF will be approved by January fifteen. And actually, you could argue that the betting market is going to skew a bit more bearish than what people really think, because if you're really optimistic and you would vote in favor of this. Well, you would rather invest just just by Bitcoin than to uh, try and make a, a paltry return, right? Where where the market is already pricing in eighty one percent success rate. Um, you know, this is nitty gritty, really. But uh, if you really want to talk about whether you should sell the news, well, I agree with Alex that um, you have to look at the actual launch of these products rather than the approval of the products. So just something to keep in mind if there's any traders out there. I'm personally not going to trade on this. Uh, also, what I think I heard is that there's actually probably a very small gap between approval and actual launch, but that remains to be seen. Yeah, so I think this is like a big theme that's that's coming, right? Everybody needs a Bitcoin strategy. Um, and then, of course, an approval of a Bitcoin ETF will make it so much easier for anyone to just pick up the phone and say, you know, put 5% in Bitcoin. It takes five minutes and also hedge funds and pension funds and i mean you name it they can all just uh, expose themselves to bitcoin and have that like sweet extra alpha because if you if you do a um, um, a simulation of a 60 40 portfolio or any any kind of vanilla portfolio and you add just one percent bitcoin or five percent bitcoin and you look at that simulation the outperformance of your of your uh, portfolio is just massive. Even if you 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 take into account re rebalancing and things like that. So yeah, it's coming. Bitcoin versus the Nasdaq. Like to me, again, this indicates that a big move is coming. Bitcoin broke out against the Nasdaq decisively, and uh, in the past, it 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 made really epic moves after that. So that's what I'm expecting. Um, here's the Bitcoin price expressed in units of global bonds so it just it just looks very healthy and it, it has a lot of room to move to the upside of that channel so it's of course an excellent hedge for anyone who's exposed to bonds to uh to get some bitcoin exposure which you know the insurance sector could make that make that um that kind of a lot could go and in, buy into that logic and and therefore start to expose themselves a lot more to bitcoin um, like I said earlier, Bitcoin really responds to money printing. So this is a, a great chart for Raul Powell where he he created um, an index for global M2. Like M2 is the pretty much the most accepted metric for um, central bank money supply. Mm. And so you see that go up and down. Like uh, not that the supply ever goes down, but the, the speed of new money generation, that's what you're seeing. Um, the, the change year on year. So as we go into another upswing of that global M2, clearly Bitcoin is is really wanting to follow that. So that's that's just to me the big question is just are we going to have money printing? And if yes, that just means massive win in the sales for Bitcoin. So one thing I did want to touch on briefly, and this is really the last part of this presentation, is this idea of a speculative attack and uh, a specifically a Bitcoin fueled speculative attack. I'm going to let uh, Pierre Richard uh, say a word about this because he wrote a fantastic article back in 2014, so 10 years ago, about how Bitcoin will be used 
as a way to speculatively attack weaker um, assets, especially weaker fiat currencies. So Pierre said, a speculative attack that seems isolated to one or a few weak currencies but causes the purchasing power of Bitcoin to go up dramatically will rapidly turn into a contagion. The feedback loop between fiat inflation and Bitcoin deflation will throw the world into full hyper Bitcoinization. Sorry, those are a lot of new words maybe, but, but basically the mechanism he's describing is similar to what George Soros did in, um, in 1992 when you know, he's famous for the man who broke the Bank of England is, is you know, often the moniker that they give him, uh, George Soros, because what he did was he saw that there was structural weakness in the British pound and he took a lar his large dollar-based position, went to the bank, got a massive loan and sh used that to short um, the British pound and made a killing, absolutely made over a billion dollars. Uh, I forget the exact number, but that was a lot of money in 1992. And so that's the mechanism, right? You have a hard asset, a really strong asset that you can leverage and you borrow against that. And then using that borrowed money, you sell the weak asset and therefore you create selling pressure in the market. Um, and so, yeah, you, the Michael Saylor has been doing that where the hard asset is, is um, micro strategy stock, which is now more and more backed by the Bitcoin in their balance sheet borrows against that and then um uh uh what does he short he he buys more bitcoin so he shorts the dollar against bitcoin um that is uh the strategy so that's that speculative attack that's it's now being shown and and what's interesting is that we're entering now a new phase because uh what microstrategy is doing is not only are they borrowing to then use you know, short the dollar with that borrowed money, they're actually shorting the stock markets as a whole um, because what they're doing is instead of borrowing more money, they're just issuing more shares and then selling those shares into the market using the revenue to buy more Bitcoin. And so I'm going to let Preston uh, Pish explain it. He did it really well just a few days ago. He says, globally, price to earnings is grossly mispriced. So let's say PE is at around 30 right now. Say on a Bitcoin standard, it will go down to 10 uh, because people have been, you know, remember people have been using the stock market as a piggy bank. And as you, as the need for that reduces, well, the price to earnings ratio should go back to historic levels back down. So that's what he's saying. It will be down to 10. So that means you need a 66% reduction from current equity premiums to manifest itself into this new world which means you should be a seller of common stock, even the companies themselves, right? They should be selling their own stock until it gets to those low PE ratios if you are denominating your treasuries and your free cash flows into Bitcoin. So if you think on a Bitcoin standard, that is the logical thing to do. He says um, for the companies that are not doing that, the PE ratio even has further to fall. It makes sense, right? Because their treasury is going to evaporate. Their cash flow is going to get hurt more and more as the inflation increases. He says this is a really big idea that I think is lost on nearly everybody. And I agree, like this was actually, this was lost on me too. I, I, it really is a, is a massive thing that harkens back to what Pierre Richard was talking about back in 2014. Um, so where are we uh, in the US stock markets? Uh, Schiller PE, which is corrected for inflation, um, right now is at 31 for U.S. stocks. And so you could say like, oh, but you know, isn't that kind of okay still? Like, you know, historically, maybe the average was 15, but like, aren't we in a new world? Well, I mean, think about it. Like early 1900s, PE ratio were very high, but like the U.S. was one of the fastest growing real economies in the world. Like there was, you know, so much demand for stuff. And then that was before central banking. So that was the peak before central banking in a very healthy economy with almost no debt. Um, and then in uh, 1930, you had that massive run-up, which was clearly debt-fueled. I mean, that was just the central bank had come to life. The gay 20s happened. Everybody was just spending like crazy. So, of course, PE ratios went to very, very high unsustainable levels. And that was even 
those those levels were the same as today. Um, mm. And of course, the economy wasn't in in shambles as much as it is now. Like the, you know, there was actually more real world economy to the the pie than than there is today. Uh, and then, of course, the run up in the in the sixties. Um, that was um, you, you could that was also based on or that was just assuming very very low oil prices, which then changed into the seventies. And then, of course, we had the dot com bubble. So, I mean, this is just another bubble. Like, in my opinion, this is completely unsustainable. Like, like we saw before, like the economy is not healthy. We're running on borrow or, or we're on borrowed time, really. So, this has to come down. So, I agree that a speculative attack using this PE ratio and uh, for companies to issue more stock, sell it into the market, and use it to buy Bitcoin is a very strong potential and even likely tailwind for Bitcoin that uh, very few people talk about. Um, and again, this it's literally been working for MicroStrategy. Here's a here's how their uh, the amount of Bitcoin holdings per share has changed over time. And uh, the last year, I believe, they stopped issuing new debt and they've mainly focused on um, on doing that uh, anti-dilutive stuff with their uh, with their shares. So very successful, uh, interesting strategy. So, uh, summarizing this whole presentation, U.S. election pump should be good for Bitcoin. Central banks absolutely have to print again. They have to bail out governments, bail out banks, bail out uh, large corporations that are close to Wall Street. Um, Bitcoin ETFs are most likely coming very soon. Massive catalyst, of course, if, if they come. The halving, in my opinion, is... Oh, no, <laughs> the halving is certain. It's happening in 90 days. Uh, Bitcoin clearly responds to money printing, and uh, and it's also fueled by these speculative attacks. So yeah, I absolutely believe that there's going to be this wall of worry. Like there's going to be particular, you know, government crackdown concerns, all kinds of things that we will worry about. But that this is absolutely early days in this in the bull market. And Bitcoin will trade much, much higher by the end of uh, 2024. So yeah, that's it for me. I'm happy to hear if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Tour. This was a fascinating presentation uh, and we got lots of really good questions. Uh, before we move to the questions, I just wanted to uh, do a disclaimer that everything we're saying here, both in Tour's presentation and in the questions, is for entertainment purposes. It's not financial, tax, or legal advice. And it's uh, the views expressed here are of Tour in his individual capacity and do not represent necessarily the views of Unchained. Uh, basically, don't consider them as investment advice. So with that out of the way, uh, we got some really good questions. So let's start with uh, this PE being too high idea. Uh, I've seen many people uh, claim uh, that, yeah, this is unsustainable. So I just want to play devil's advocate here. Uh, as I, I've heard a thesis that is not very commonly heard, but basically that these PE ratios are sustainable. And why are they sustainable? Because basically technology is becoming a larger and larger share of the GDP. And technology has a higher PE ratio than non-technology uh, because, you know, higher margins and higher growth rates and so forth. And so basically claiming that it went 3x from 1880, um, some people say that's not necessarily unsustainable, you know, when we have robots and flying cars and all of that, probably the PE ratio of the stock market will be high. So what are your thoughts on that tour? Now, the first thing that came to mind was this Bitcoin pragmatism of where does a yield come from? You know, because basically if you break it down, the PE ratio, it's, it's pretty simple. It's just, you have a turnover, there is money that flows through your hands and the market is going to give a value on your stock, on your company, based on how much money flows through your hands. Because it assumes that a certain percentage of that you'll be able to capture and keep, which is your profits. And that can then flow back to investors via um, dividends and things like that. Or, you know, stock purchases and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, and in my opinion, a high PE ratio has this assumption of growth. It just assumes that markets are going to keep growing. And that 
in my opinion, just flies against all the evidence that we're seeing. Like, you know, the markets are actually stagnating or shrinking. We have seen a lot of, uh, luckily, um, growth in energy. For example, oil production is now at, um, at highs, uh, very close to the all-time high, both for the world and definitely for the U.S. Actually, U.S. oil production is now double that of 2006. So that's just staggering, right, because of the fracking and, and technology. So... So in that sense, like, yeah, they kind of have been able to grow the pie, but with more political tension, like as the world deglobalizes, that's really going to threaten that, um, that old model of, uh, oh, we don't need to keep large uh, stores of, of uh, our goods. We can just on the fly always order more. It's like, well, you can't do that if the Strait of Hormuz is being, you know, um, if uh, container ships are, are being uh, rocketed and stuff. Um, so just to me, there's a lot of assumptions that are baked into this high PE ratio. For example, think about a house. Like if you own a house and you can rent it out, like what should the price of the house be based on how much rent you can collect over um, over a year? Should it be 50 times the annual rent or should it be 100 times? I mean, like as the the neighborhood gets more dilapidated and people lose their jobs and, you know, even if you're saying like, oh yeah, but the rent is slightly down, so that ratio has to adjust as well. It has to adjust to the world. There being more risks. What you can have a catastrophic failure of the house. There can be a fire. They can, you can have uh, squatters come in. The police is not there. And so, similarly here, like a PE ratio, like all these companies can also ca catastrophically fail. And I think those kind of things are absolutely not priced in. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, another question here uh, is someone who's covered technology in the media. I'm blown away by how many people will spend 50 hours digging into Apple's firmware code, won't spend five hours looking at Bitcoin. Why do you think some of the brightest technologies in the world are ignoring Bitcoin? Yeah. And uh, was, was this person talking about specific technologists or technology companies? Technology media. So the idea is that, you know, people who analyze technology will spend a lot of time going into the tiniest details about the competitive edge of this or that company, but they just don't spend a time looking at Bitcoin. And I can tell you as someone who was 10 years in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley overall was very anti-Bitcoin and pro other, uh, you know, crypto technologies. On well, yeah. Alan Farrington has written a great piece about, um, I think, at least he mentions like the capital strip mine and he talks about Silicon Valley as being kind of philosophically antithetical to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is about low time preference. It's about investing in the future, like really taking your time with things. Uh, in so many ways, you can see that. And Silicon Valley, the, the, you know, part of or a big part of the growth has become has happened because of the consumer economy, like consumption focused, like all these, like I mean, like like I said, like all the that uh, comedy series, like all those companies are very, very consumer focused. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that also journalists and media who have a technology focus, quote unquote, are uh, just kind of oblivious. Uh, they don't really understand uh, economics. I forget, but it's just, it's just out of their wheelhouse. They just don't understand it. And it's kind of opposite, right? I mean, the success of Bitcoin is happening because the, this whole system that allowed them to grow so big is, um, is, is, is diminishing. And also, I mean, keep in mind technology, why do we associate it with like Facebook and stuff like that? Like almost every company uses technology, like, like, a, uh, like a, an oil driller uses cutting edge technology. Like, you know, uh, somebody, I mean, so we always associate it with consumer goods, but, um, tech doesn't have a monopoly on that. Tech is everywhere. Yeah, that's a great point. I remember uh, learning that the first autonomous vehicles were actually in mines, like in 2014 or something, because someone who owns the mine owns the whole land. So they don't need to like, uh, you know, they don't have like rules of the road and stuff like that. Uh, cool. Next question. So you mentioned that the difference in the capex of energy and technology is unsustainable. Uh, what do you see happening if, does, if, if it actually changes? So it's like we get more investment in energy 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, that's exciting. Let me try and see if I can find back that slide, uh, CapEx. Yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, basically, it's kind of a return to sanity, really. It's it's tough. It's kind of it's kind of like a, what we see happen in Argentina now. Like, I mean, of course, it's very, very early days, but, you know, what Millet is doing is simply saying, no hay plata, like, there is no money. We just don't have the money to keep pumping things in the economy. Uh, for and and so, for example, subsidy cultural subsidies gets go are abolished. All kinds of subsidies are abolished, and so then the economy has to figure out like, well, what is the priority? And so, rather than tax dollars being levied by the government going to subsidized actors who make movies that are consumer based, obviously, those dollars never are taxed in the first place. They stay with the consumer. People use them to put gas in their car, and then the oil company eventually has more money to to invest in in and and expand their capex and 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 be proactive and uh, and expand capacity. So I mean, in short, it just means that yeah, we, we need a larger part, a larger percentage of the economy to go to um, to mineral exploration, to go to farming. Uh, to go to oil production, energy production, those kind of things. So yeah, it, it'll just be a more basic economy. Like uh, less people are gonna have white collar jobs. More people are gonna be, uh, you know, digging around on a farm or 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 uh, working in a factory or things like that. It's 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 part of the rebalancing process. Awesome. Uh, next question is: What factors do you look for to understand whether Bitcoin is decoupling from other risk assets? Yeah, whether well, Bitcoin is decoupling from other risk assets. Well, that's a loaded question, right? Because it assumes Bitcoin is a risk asset. Um, but I, I think I know, I know what they mean. Yeah, you know, from a volatility point of view, or um, definitely like the correlation, right? Because Bitcoin has been assumed. To go up and down with, I mean, we saw it with crypto, right? I mean, crypto, in my opinion, is that's the real risk asset, um, and of course, it's it's been going up and down with the Nasdaq. So to me, that's actually a good one. The the Nasdaq versus Bitcoin, the chart I showed earlier, um, that really shows that yes, there is convergence and it can last for years, but then you have that massive decoupling, and that's that's happening right now. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so next question is, do you believe the insurance sector will be one of the primary beneficiaries of the ETF on REM? It really could be. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I wish I was more versed and I, I need to study it more in terms of what are more legal hurdles, uh, because I do know, for example, in life insurance, there are just legally defined buckets. Like you can only invest this much or that much of your, uh, entire, uh, portfolio into um, into Bitcoin, but still, you know, I think most of them are at zero percent. So, even I think, I think the BIS even said that regular banks can now invest up to two percent or something in crypto, which includes Bitcoin. So, yeah, I mean, until we hit those limits, I, maybe they don't matter that much. Yeah, I think I think the insurance sector is going to be very very thirsty for um, an asset like Bitcoin, which which in their view, it just diminishes risk. Like it's, and you just add that little 1% at the tail and it uh, changes the the risk profile of your entire portfolio. Because they, for years and decades, the assumption was, oh, bonds are the safe assets and cash. And, and that's completely at the window now. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. uh, another question here is about a different version of the soft landing that people are talking about there, uh, which is basically... If you print money, if you expand the money supply a couple percentage points more than the interest rates, uh, you could inflate the debt away. So, for example, if the interest rates are at 6% and you expand the money supply by like 8 or 9%, which is not that crazy compared to, um, you know, previous, I, I believe, I, I read uh, overall that like if you take all the currencies in the world, the weighted average is around 8%. Uh, increase per per year. Uh, so, like, could that be a scenario where there's no nothing catastrophic is happening? So, let's say eight percent money supply increase will cause some inflation, but it won't be like crazy inflation. But it will be able to, um, you know, just get rid of all the debt we currently have. Yeah, I mean, that is kind of the hope of a lot of people. But I'm afraid that the inflation is already baked in. It's like a musical chairs 
situation where there's so many people in the room and there's only, there's like a hundred people in the room. There's only five chairs to sit on. Like there's so many overlapping claims. Like people, for example, people who have a, um, a, a 401k that's traditional 60, 40, the real value of that might only be 20, even though they believe it's a hundred now, like the a purchasing power equivalent real value of that might only be 20. So. They could be looking at, and we've seen that many times in Latin America where all of a sudden people just lose it all. And so there's, so I just, to me, how much money printing exactly is happening right now? Like that is the, that is the flow part of the equation. And that's not looking at the stock and the stock is, we have so much worthless paper in the world. And it's just a matter of time before people find out about that. And so, um, like, I mean, remember how crazy it was that we had negative interest rates on, um, uh, negative yields, sorry, on government bonds. And, and yet people had loads and loads of these sitting in their portfolios, uh, and that's changing. And, and so once you follow that cliff, you have a rush to the exits and you, you, you the, the value of these, of this paper just evaporates. So I think it's maybe similar to, you know, how we had these algorithmic stable coins where it was like, yeah, but we, you know, we can just kind of you know, toggle the levers enough and like, we'll always like engineer our way out of the problem. That's kind of how I feel about this, this idea of like, oh, but what if we just print like just enough, but not too much to, uh, yeah, of course we are going to print our way out of the inflation. That's going to happen, but I don't think it's going to, you can do that in a soft way. It just never does. Cause 90% of people are 95 or 98 does not even realize that the value of money could go down so fast. Like, you know, that, that's what creates that, that, um, gradually then suddenly affect the run for the exit. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, uh, maybe as the last question here, so we know as Bitcoiners that, you know, we hold views that are not traditional and, uh, you know, we make money, uh, because of that, <laughs> you know, uh, I think it was Peter Thiel that said something like the, the secret to making money is to be right when everybody else is wrong and then like you can make money. But I was wondering if you have any view or anything that you see where you think most Bitcoiners get something wrong. So something that's like hmm. common within our circles, within Bitcoin Twitter, that you have a different opinion. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, for example, I haven't gotten involved in the whole debate about blockchain spam like that, you know, ordinals and, and BRC 20 contracts. And, and it's all very technical sounding, but basically people are putting stuff on the blockchain that is technically just not a simple Bitcoin transaction. And it's taking a lot of room. And some of those things that they put on the blockchain, they can kind of put on it for cheap. Like they pay less per byte than you would for a normal transaction. And so there's just a lot of drama around that and debates and, uh, there's now a new mining pool that that's based on Luke Jr.'s um, 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 software, and Jack Dorsey endorses it as well. Where you can like strip out some of those transactions and and have like a a cleaned up blockchain. And um, so, you know, it's just maybe it's just a minor thing, but I imagine if you're new to Bitcoin, maybe it looks like this big upheaval. And I just don't really worry about that because um, the the foundational. The, the, the market is very good at ironing out those kinks because the more, if, if a certain contract gets very popular, like the BRC 20 contracts, I think like 80% of the blocks were occupied by that. Uh, and that's why the fees spiked to like uh, $50 a transaction briefly. And, and the solution for high prices is high prices. So that means also those contracts get really expensive. And then uh, people tend to back off and they, they look for solutions on second layers. And I mean, you know, people that are in Bitcoin for, are, have been in Bitcoin for a long time. Remember, for example, uh, Eric Voorhees had this uh, company called Satoshi Dice back in 2012, 13. And what they were doing was they were kind of, they had designed a little smart contract on the Bitcoin blockchain where you could gamble. So you could gamble on uh, using Bitcoin and uh, you would kind of roll the dice and then you had your odds one in a hundred or one in a thousand or one in 10. You could toggle the odds and get a payout. 
So that was all directly on the blockchain. And so people back then as well were upset, like, oh, this is bad and Bitcoin is going to be destroyed by this bad news. But eventually it just became too expensive for Satoshi Dice to do that. And so gambling platforms moved into other areas. So I just see, you know, there's just one one thing that I see that I, I feel like the, the level of drama is not really justified by, you know, and, and if anything, it's a good thing because fees are going up and people are now realizing like, oh, we need to be smarter about second layer and lightning and, you know, maybe maybe liquid is not a bad platform. And so so we're, we're seeing that it pushes resources into second layer development. Awesome. I actually see some more questions that uh, came in the chat, so uh, I'll read them too. So uh, the Nobel laureate winning theory, commonly known as efficient market theory, says that pure markets quickly absorb new information by adjust adjusting up or down asset prices. Why Bitcoin isn't already trading above 100K or beyond? The only thing that troubles me is that Bitcoin doesn't always comport to efficient market theory. Either the theory is wrong or we are wrong. How do you reconcile Bitcoin's relatively low price of 43 and a half thousand? Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a it's a popular theory, um, but it's wrong in my opinion. And and you know you can if you're curious about some criticism of efficient market theory, I'd recommend um, googling efficient market theory and Austrian school of economics or something like that. Definitely, Austrian eco economists have written about this. And uh, yeah, it's just not true, you know, um, people, inform I think especially Friedrich Hayek has written about how information spreads in society. And it's not like it gets airdropped onto everybody at the same time, like information trickles slowly into the economy and, um, and prices follow. Like people, you know, their, their investing behavior is based on the information they have and the knowledge they have and the beliefs they have. and. Uh, and Bitcoin is very heretical, you know, it really is, is kind of, it's, it's, it's financial blasphemy. You know, it, it's, it's a very challenging concept to get. Um, it, it involves cryptography, it involves, uh, you know, economics, it involves um, computer science. Um, and you have to kind of put all those pieces together to really grasp what it is. And it's just very, and it also what I mean with heretical is that money is kind of binary like you know either you win or you don't um and so if bitcoin really wins it means that a lot of the fiat currencies are gonna be very very small in comparison and so it's just very it's a very challenging concept uh for for many reasons there's also career risk involved like if you work for a fund and a large fund say billions of dollars but you know you're just one of the analysts then you you can face career risk by really sticking your neck out and advocating for this and then maybe you're a bit too excited and there's a 40 percent correction that you didn't see coming and uh that could cost you your promotion for example so yeah i um i it's something that you learn in bitcoin is that no absolutely like that's why i put out my reports in the bear market because the the price gets so undervalued that you almost start questioning your own sanity it's like how can this be like this technology is so sound and yet the world is saying it's only worth back in 2020 three thousand dollars for a bitcoin that's just not right so yeah i mean it's it's uh, just like with science right i mean there's a lot of things that can be very popularly believed that are just wrong um so it's the same with price Awesome. And uh, maybe the last question here is, uh, can you talk about KYC and non-KYC Bitcoin advantages, disadvantages? Also, can you talk about the importance or not of actually spending uh, Bitcoin at this time? As a new resident of El Salvador, I face a lot of people passionate about using it. I feel more relaxed about the process about BTC adoption happening organically. And also as a U.S. citizen, with KYC BTC, uh, I find it problematic, but I would like to hear your perspective. Mm, interesting. Yeah, so KYC stands for Know Your Customer. Um, most people don't deal with KYC that often in their life. Like you, you go through it once when you set up your brokerage account, maybe your bank account. And it's basically based on this idea that uh, financial organizations need to know their customers so that, um, um, so, so that, um, they don't allow them to do nefarious things. Like basically, if, if you're a terrorist, you shouldn't get through the KYC process. Um, 
But of course, it, it means that your information now is in a database and it could, it could leak. And it means that, especially if you live in like a Brazil or a, a developing economy, if, if your personal information leaks and it gets linked to you having a certain financial status, then you could become a target for robberies and things like that. And then, of course, there is also the reasoning, uh, especially harder to cypherpunks think this way, is that, you know, if, if we don't know how government is going to evolve in the future, even in the West. And so if I'm transparent about all my Bitcoin holdings, then it's easier for them to find and confiscate uh, everything that I have. Um, so that's kind of like the background. Um, and so, but there's a flip side to that. There is, you know, you could say, okay, I'm going to, only buy bitcoins that are freshly mined by a friend of mine and i want to pay cash then okay then you have that non-kyc bitcoin which is almost as good as yeah cash that there's a challenge there because then you cannot use that for um for example use as collateral if you want a loan from a bank well they're going to ask you to prove the source of funds like how did you get those bitcoin as part of their process um and so so when you, if you want to leverage Bitcoin, you can usually only really do that with um, with KYC Bitcoin, with white Bitcoin. Um, and uh, there is also another element to the discussion, which is non-KYC Bitcoin. If you bought it, for example, I don't know, from a friend or something, there's these companies like Chainalysis who analyze the blockchain. If it's not coming from a very big company that you originally bought it from, it's more like an obscure exchange and it's somewhere in Europe or something in Russia, who knows, then that blockchain analysis might uh, show red lights like, oh, this is associated with money laundering. And even if you didn't do anything wrong, that money can, that those Bitcoin can get flagged as like kind of tainted. And uh, I mean, so anyway, for all those reasons, I, um, it, 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 it's it's hard to give a general recommendation about that. I, I do think it's wise that if you live in a, a developing economy to be very discreet about being a Bitcoiner or how many Bitcoin you have and to try and avoid leaking information to especially local institutions. I think that's very wise. And then as far as these, you know, kind of more con, uh, kind of, you know, things going bad in society type, concerns like like what if the government goes after my coins i would say i mean yeah i mean it's it's i'm definitely not against like people having a part of their bitcoin in in a, in a very discreet way and uh, yeah like one way to do that is to buy them mine them directly that's definitely a great way mine them directly or buy have some kind of deal with a miner where they're because they're, those are the most pristine bitcoins that's probably why i'm talking about this too because you could try and find them from some guy who happens to have Bitcoin, but then you don't know if, if that is going to bring up flags from chain analysis and stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tour. This was a fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for everybody who asked questions. We unfortunately ran out of time, so we can't uh, get to all of them. But, uh, you know, the purpose of these signature events is really to give you guys access to the best uh, thought leaders in, in Bitcoin and so you can ask them questions. So thank you all. Uh, Tour has a fantastic report called How to Position uh, for the Next Bitcoin Boom, which was published, I believe, like in April, and it's still as relevant as ever. Uh, so uh, you can Google it. It's on the Unchained website. Uh, and thanks again for everybody for uh, coming and participating. And thank you, Tour, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, everyone.